Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back speaking to YPORs, although a lot of my life is spent talking to YPORs, forum, friends, and now a wider circle. So I'm here to talk to you about my work, my journey as a, as a cultural entrepreneur over the last, um, there we go, uh, over the last 20 odd years. Um, this is my office. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm a hypnotherapist. I'm licensed in New York. I'm a professor at the medical school and have also been recently the let's say, the, uh, the topic of interest and death threats from ISIS, Qaeda, and more recently, my ex-wife. And I know what you're thinking. What would a nice guy like me doing garnering all these death threats and fatwas? And the answer lies, it's complicated. I'm going to take you in the spirit of hypnosis through a journey back into my mind, Back to a child who was nine years old and told his parents when he grew up he was going to be a writer. And they said, that's a fantastic hobby knife. Don't think about doing it for work. And I listened to them. I mean, I was a good student, did all my degrees and stuff, but couldn't let go of the writing. And that's always my first recourse when I, when I encounter a social problem. And I'm always inspired by the writings of other people. And so one of the first kind of writers that really struck me, struck a chord with me, um, was Shel Silverstein. Maybe he's familiar to some of you guys from his books, the, the, the Missing Piece or The Missing Piece Meets the Big O. Fantastic books. You can read that at age two, read it at age 102. You get different messages from them. This inspired me. So when I was 23, 24 years old, 23, came back to Kuwait from, my, from, from undergrad education, a man had just been fired from his job because of his religion. Okay? And being somebody who grew up being bullied for my height, my weight, my, I mean, you name it, it was there, my glasses. I had, I had this special kind of connection with people who were bullied. And so this guy got fired from his job because of his religion. And, because it, and with the guy that fired him gave out leaflets to the local community apologizing that had he known his religion, he wouldn't have hired him to begin with. And I thought, my God, what can I do about this? I wrote about it in the newspaper. And you know, I write in English. I don't write in Arabic. And um, so maybe five people read the piece. This is pre-internet. And it didn't hit the spot for me. So I wrote and illustrated my first book, inspired by Shel Silverstein's book called To Bounce or Not to Bounce. And the book was very simple. It was about a land called Bouncy Land where everybody was round. In that society, basically, they had two values, how high you bounce and how fast, how fast you roll. That's it. The main character is born as a half circle. He can't do either. You know, his parents are dreaming of when he's born. You know, I'm going to bounce him. I'm going to roll him. Uh, he's born as a half circle, and they don't know what to do. He's different. What are we going to do with him? You know, he gets picked on at school. He's ostracized. He wants to do something with himself that's different, doesn't know what. At the end, though, there's a flood. And during that flood, him being a boat shape, he was able to save all the inhabitants of Bouncy Land. And this forced society to reevaluate their, 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 the importance of diversity. This book did well. It's still being printed in, in, in Arabic. Um, won an award from UNESCO. And so I was both excited and kind of confused when I won an award for children's literature for a book I intended for adults, but that's a different story. So this book, you know, back then things were happening in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, and this is where my mind was. It was about, but, you know, so I became a children's book writer. And I got my first contract, a book contract, from a YPO, uh, his family, and I didn't know what YPO was at the time, but this was my introduction into the world of YPO. So book two comes out. He goes to a land called Rainbow Land, where they judge you not according to how high you bounce and how fast you roll, but what color of your bow tie and where it is on the rainbow. So red is better than orange, better than yellow, all the way down to violet, the worst place in society. Okay? So he crosses over to this land by water. You know, he meets somebody with a blue b b ribbon crying because her parents won't let her marry, marry somebody with a blue, b blue uh, ribbon because what does red and blue give you? Yeah, purple, the last place on the rainbow. Okay, cross-cultural, cross-ethnic, cross-religious marriages, cross-color, whatever you want. They always, as, as people do, people uh, often put words in God's mouth and say it's the natural order of things. So he, they point up to the sky and say it's the natural order of things. And the main character, Bouncy Jr., points to the reflection of the rainbow in the river and shows them what's on top is actually now on the bottom. That nobody's better than anybody based on those principles. Okay? So that book does fine. Book three gets banned and I quit, eight, quit writing at the age of 27. In book three, I pushed the envelope a bit further than people would have liked. In book three, he goes to a land called Thailand, spelled T-I-E land, as in Thailand, where all these characters are actually huge. They're big, but they're grander than life, okay? And they wear ties. So they go to visit this place, and no one knows why, but all these huge, larger-than-life characters are now the same size as everybody else. They ain't so great anymore. But because of their laws, which forbid them to buy new ties, they're wearing the tie of their father, who wears the tie of his father before him. So their ties are huge compared to their body. So when they roll, their ties get under them, make them slow and inefficient. 
And when they bounce, their ties cover their eyes. They don't know where they're going to land. And those that take off their tie in protest get shunned. So he asked to see the law, Bouncy Jr. And the law says you must wear of the ties of your fathers, not the ties of your fathers. So they get every tailor in town, every tie in town, and from the same material, they cut out new ties to better serve their modern day needs. So I get asked point blank, this is about the Quran, isn't it? And I said, huh? I said, These, this book was the, published the day my son Hamid was born. It came out the day he was born. It took me nine months or, te, or a year to come up with the idea, but it took a couple of days to write because only a thousand words. And, um, and that was kind of, you know, that was my first kind of, we're not, this is not going to happen. I quit writing, went to the States, 9-11 happened, and my next inspiration came from comic books. So the first inspiration of books came from Shell Service, and the second one came from comics. And basically, the idea was, at the time, I, I just graduated, I, you know, I'd done my doctorate in psychology, went to business school, didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I found myself in a, in a cab ride going from Edgware Road to Harrods in the summer, which is a pilgrimage every Kuwaiti makes once a lifetime. And that cab ride, my sister turned to me and said, Naif, you know, you told me you go back to writing after, after school. You know, you know go back. and for me, going back to writing for kids just didn't make sense. I mean, I'd done all this, all this writing. I, I, I didn't intend to write for kids to begin with and, you know, went to business school, did my doctorate, just was not interested. Um, and so I, I kind of, in my own way, told her to be quiet. And I start, but I started to free associate, you know, because I, 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 you know, I said to her, I said, for me to go back, it has to be something that has the potential of Pokemon. I said Pokemon. My next thought was there had been a fatwa against Pokemon. It's actually illegal in some places in the, Arab, in the Muslim world. My next thought was, my God, what's happened to Islam and who's making these random decisions for my kids? My next thought was of Allah or God and how disappointed he must be. My next thought was that Allah had 99 attributes. And ironically, that brought me full circle back to, to, uh, to Pokemon, which is a concept of over a thousand attributes. And that was my aha moment. Okay, so I pitched it to her. She loved it. I didn't let her draw. I went, because she's actually an artist. I went on and, and raised money for this. And I created a pitch which went like this. I said, if you look at the superheroes that exist in the world today, this is back in 2003, there are two groups. One that comes, and they're based on Judeo-Christian archetypes. So like the prophets in the Bible, all the superheroes are missing their parents. Batman's parents die at six. Superman's die on Krypton. Uh, Spider-Man's raised by his own uncle. And all of them, like the prophets, have a message delivered from God through Gabriel. You know, but the, the, the superheroes get it from above through a messenger, right? So, so, so Spider-Man's taking a, uh, Peter Parker's taking a photograph and the spider comes in from above and gives him his message through a bite. Superman is sent on a boat by his parents to new parents in a ship, very much like Moses was on the Nile. And you hear the voice of his father saying to earth, I have sent to you my only son, right? And the reason for that is because there's a Western conspiracy I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The reason for that is the Bible's known as the greatest ever story ever told. And I told my investors that nobody's done this with Islam except the bad guys. Let me go in, lift some stories, secularize them, and create new content aimed at, you know, fighting for the hearts and minds of kids who are being, who's, who are being taught to use the religion to hate, but do it in a secular way. So the storylines that we come up with have no religion in them. Um, so I was, we were able to lay, over, the, over 10 years, we were able to raise roughly $40 million for this project. Uh, and I tell people, of all my accomplishments, the one I'm proudest of is I'm the only Kuwaiti that went to Beirut and actually came out with money. It's never been done before. <laughs> you know, when we got funded, we got funded by an Islamic investment bank from Saudi-owned in the second round, and uh, one of my sons, who's now 16 and taller than I am, was, you know, seven year old, and, you know, my, I have six sons, I have six boys, and, and if you're from the West, you know, if you, you, and you want to know how many daughters I have, we don't talk about them. I'm kidding, I don't have any daughters. People always say, oh, how many daughters? If I had them, I'd tell you, I have six boys. So Faisal, my second son, was about this high. Was, I was on the phone, I, you know, the bank was called Unicorn. Unicorn said this, Unicorn said that. I'm not sure, I'm gonna talk to Unicorn later. I hang up and he looks at me, he's like, Baba, you know, big brown eyes. I said, what? He goes, you talk to unicorns too? So we, we developed, we developed the, the, the storylines in 2003, Baghdad had just fallen, but you know, throughout the whole course of history, Baghdad being a great city has fallen to the hands of many in the, in the past. And one of the times is the, the Mongol invasion in 1258, the Mongols invade, all the books are thrown, of the great the Dar al Hikmah library are thrown in the Tigris River, the Tigris changes color with ink, this story passed on generation after generation. I took that as a pivot and inspiration for my storyline. So in my version, all that knowledge and wisdom in the books were actually saved onto 99 stones through a secret plot hatched by the librarians. And those stones are smuggled out of Baghdad through, and through Arabia into Andalusia and Spain where they're safe for 200 years. But in 1492, two important things happened. The first is the fall of Baghdad, sorry, the first fall, the fall of Grenada. The second is uh, that Columbus gets lost and finds the US. 
right? So we go back to my stories, 33 of the stones are buried, are, are, are uh, hidden in the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria and spread in the New World. 33 go on the Silk Road to China, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, and 33 are spread between Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Now it's 2016 and you have 99 heroes from 99 different countries, almost evenly split between boys and girls. Um, and I had an opportunity to respond to one, one of my bullies. So in my first set of books, one of my cousins called me up and said, Nayef, you know, I want a royalty on the books. I said, why? He goes, if we hadn't picked on you as a kid for being fat, you wouldn't have done those books. These are the bouncy books. So in these books, in, in, the, in, this, in this TV show uh, and, and comic book series, which eventually became, I have a cousin in the bed that his nickname is Booty. And um, he used to bully me way into my teens. And so in episode five of the 99, if you haven't watched it yet, the main bad guy's name is what? It's Booty. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, get even. And so I told him once with a group of friends, I said, you know, you used to make fun of me in front of 20 kids, but 800 million kids know that you're the bad guy now. <laughs> so we got some really good positive media attention. Basically, the idea was how do you reposition Islam to Muslims? That was the, that was the basic, because my, my theory was if we can de-link, we can de-link uh, the bad guys from religion by linking positive multicultural tolerant messages, which are there in Islam, right? But if nobody steps up and does this, then they own the space. Right? And the only way to delink them is to kind of link more positivity because then it becomes a matter of interpretation. It's not a matter of religion. This was the, the, main, the main impetus. This, the 99 came out in several languages, came out in China on mobile phones. There was a 99 village theme park that launched, that launched in Kuwait, some back to school products that came out in Spain and Turkey. Um, and we were able to develop a TV show with Endemol in the UK that showed in 70 countries, came out in Mandarin on Cartoon Network, came out on Netflix in the US, and became really the first IP from the region to go global in such a way. The storylines were very much based on multiculturalism and tolerance. You know, the, there were boys and girls. Some of the girls wore the hijab, some didn't. One wore the burqa. And the idea was that there are different ways to being human. And we use those values that Islam shares with humanity. And we got to do a fun thing. So, so back in, um, so my, I'm the father of six boys, I told you. So when Rakan was born, uh, who's now, he's now, he's now uh, seven, uh, New Year's 2009, my dad called me and said, you know, Naif, I want you to call your son Barack. Obama is going to be president in 20 days. Uh, I said, uh, uh, no. Uh, and then somebody else called me and said, we heard you had a boy, a, a child. I said, yes. They said, congratulations, boy or girl. I said, what do you think? They said, they said a boy. I said, yes. They said, oh, now we have enough boys to liberate Palestine. And I thought, whatever happened to playing basketball? Right? And so I took those two ideas and wove them into an op-ed called Barack al Mutawa about why I would not name my son Barack. This was published in the Chicago Tribune in the op-ed pages on Inauguration Day. Okay? So park that thought. The same day Marvel comes out with a copy of Spider-Man with Obama on the cover, which is a signal to the world that Obama likes comic books. So, Paul Le so I went to Paul Levitz, who was the president of DC Comics at the time, a friend of mine, and I said, Paul, Marvel beat you guys. He said, yes. I said, I have an idea to to counter them and one-up them. He said, how? I said, and this was you know, this idea of you never know what you get till you ask for it. I said, how about when Obama reaches out to the Muslim world, which became the speech from Cairo at the time, it was just rumors. I said, how about when that happens, the 99, my characters, reach back out to Batman and Superman. He loved it. It was the first time in 15 years they do this, but six books came out that have Batman, Superman, and a Wonder Woman that found her clothes after 70 years of looking, <laughs> working together with the 99 for world peace. Now, these books had people who supported them and people who were, let's say, against them <laughs> for now. Uh, but first, I'd like you to hear directly from somebody who supported them. Over the past year, the United States has been reaching out and listening. We've joined interfaith dialogues and held town halls, roundtables and listening sessions with thousands of people around the world, including many of you. And like so many people, you've extended your hand in return each in your own way, as entrepreneurs and educators, as leaders of faith and of science. I have to say, perhaps the most innovative response was from Dr. Naif Al-Mutawa of Kuwait, who joins us here tonight. Where is uh, Dr. Mutawa? Right here. His, uh, his comic books have captured the imagination of so many young people with super, superheroes who embody the teachings and tolerance of Islam. After my speech in Cairo, he had a similar idea. So in his comic book, Superman and Batman reached out to their Muslim counterparts. And I hear they're making progress, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what could go wrong? 
what could go wrong? So um, we got our first fatwa from Fox News. Obama's Muslim and this proves it. He's trying to brainwash your kids with Sharia superheroes. Anybody watching the show will become radicalized and become a jihadi. My favorite criticism though, is we can't let those Muslims brainwash our children like the Mexicans did with Dora the Explorer. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And they will be voting for Trump, mind you, okay? I got attacked on Twitter by, I think it was Daniel Pipes or Robert Spencer, one of these Islamophobes. They, 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 they called me an evil Arab American terrorist. To which my reply on Twitter was, I can't believe you called me American. <laughs> evil is subjective, but I'm not American. But this didn't just happen in the States. This also happened, unfortunately, back home. So I was sued in February last year. So every New Year's Eve, the way to celebrate New Year's is to come after me for the past three years. Two years ago, it was the Saudis. Last uh, New Year's, it was the Jordanians. And I have to tell you, the Saudis are really polite compared to the Jordanians. They just wanted me to go to hell. The Jordanians, my mother, my sister, I mean, it was just ridiculous on Facebook. But anyway, there's some cross-cultural differences. Um, but this is, so this Kuwaiti guy came after me, a lawyer, asking basically for me to go on trial. But he wants to stop the show before, before it goes on TV in Ramadan. Well, it had gone on TV two Ramadans ago, so I'm not sure what he's trying to do, but changing the past. He gets ignored by the government, okay? Then he submits in writing to the Grand Council of Muftis in Saudi asking for a fatwa about my work. And he gets it, okay? So for those of you who don't understand what a fatwa is, let me explain it to you. A fatwa is the answer to a question without checking the contents of the question, okay? So it might surprise you, but I agree with what the Sheikh said. The problem is, it's based on misstatements and lies, okay? So this happens, and in May, I'm, I'm faced with my first decision. I do a lot of public speaking. I'm, I'm invited to speak in Saudi. Am I gonna go or not? I go. One of the kids asked me, said, you know, have you ever been sued because of the 99? And I thought, that's a weird question for a 10-year-old. Why? He goes, our teacher said not to watch it because no good can come of it. I said, what'd you do? He goes, we didn't know what it was. We looked for it, we found it, we watched it, we like it. And, uh, you, know, what, you know, George Harrison's reaction to the Beatles' b records and books being burned and broken in the 60s was, you know, well, they had to buy them to burn them, right? So it's publicity. But in the end, this led to him come upping his game in June, a new lawsuit against me, this time for blasphemy, for heresy. This led to another fatwa from Kuwait. Again, it was garbage in, garbage out. Mind you, the ministries of information in Saudi and Kuwait approved it, but there were fatwas against it, which didn't stop it commercially, Right, but it was, an, again, it was being bullied. This led to the death threats from Qaeda and, and, and ISIS, which led to being on the front page of Kuwait's newspapers, which is how my mom found out. Uh, that was a fun conversation. Which, I don't know why I'd be smiling if I got shot, but this is one of the people posted online. But this is, you know, the idea basically, they, they, they wanted to burn you at the stake. This was the idea. And, and my lawyer had gotten permission for the police to protect me outside my clinic, and I said, listen, I'm a psychologist. I'm not gonna have police protection. Why would people who are depressed or anxious come see me? It doesn't make sense. Well, apparently it follows the same rules as real estate in Beirut. Oh, there's a crisis? Real estate prices just went up, right? So what happened basically is I got more clients even though all this publicity was I'm about to get shot. So this is a selfie outside the police station after the interrogation, which is actually quite polite. Uh, and it led to my being, after a year of trial, not guilty on the charge of blasphemy. So thank God for that. Um, so the only thing that they were gonna be burning, the only steak being burned is gonna be probably at their next barbecue. So here in, in Dubai, I was awarded the Islamic, media, the Islamic Economy Award for media for the same project that I was on trial for in Kuwait. So what am I doing now in terms of, in terms of stuff? So I'm doing hypnosis. Just a quick couple of stories. I was doing hypnosis in the clinic one time, and of course, because it's in Kuwait, the prayer comes on five times a day and the prayer started happening during hypnosis, and I thought, gee, you know, I wonder what I'm, this is interesting, I don't know what to do with it. And then I found myself on a British Airways flight next to a man whose son introduced himself to me in the economy section, I was stuck by the window, and the boy went off, and the man talked to me for six hours about how he was possessed, and he could fly, and his wife had to hold him down, and I thought, didn't realize I could hold a straight face for a few hours, it was my first time doing that. 
And, and, but what came of that was this is really interesting because it, it, apparently it was the way that the Quran was being read to him that was very hypnotic when he came, went to the sheikhs. And I thought, this is interesting, what can I do with that? And it took going back to New York to do some more training where it was through headphones where I started saying, you know, this is very interesting. Maybe there's a way to take stuff from Islam and use it during hypnosis, which I've been doing for the past year, which has been very, very interesting. And I know what you're thinking now. How does one reply to a fatwa? Well, I finally did. I have this book coming out in Saudi soon. I went back 20 years to the same characters I created, the bouncy characters. And basically, it takes you to the time before when nobody had bow ties. They were all circles, and they find triangles for the first time. They play around with them, trying to figure out what to do with the triangles, and they decide all the boys wear the triangles on their chins and all the girls on their head. And after a while, some of the boys and girls aren't happy. They take them off, and they say, what else can we do with them? And they create bow ties and ribbons. And this causes a chasm in society. They say, no, no, you can't do that. It's against our traditions. You have to wear them on your chin and your head. So they make a line in the sand, and those who wear them on their chins go to the east of the line, and those that don't are on the west. The next generation, same thing happens. People from both sides want to wear their triangles differently. This leads to, they take their triangles away, and they create weapons from the same triangles. So these same cultural ar artifacts, or religion, or ideology, whatever you want to call it, are used for war. And they end up killing each other using these cultural symbols until they realize they're just killing themselves because every generation there are kids who want to be like the next side. And they they, they, then they get together and they create from the same triangles or cultural artifacts, they create slides for entertainment, they create rooftops for security, and they create cultural stuff like pyramids out of them. And they go, work together on a, a journey of peace. And if you're, not con if you're concrete in your thinking, let me hit it home. This is what the triangles mean. So, I'm a psychologist, hypnotherapist. I wasn't happy with how Islam saw the West. I wasn't happy with how the West saw Islam, but more importantly for my children, I wasn't happy with how Islam saw itself. And that's where I wanted to make my change. YPO has been a very important part of this process. Um, from the very beginning, skip to the our time is out, let's go to the last slide here. So IPO has been a very important part of the process from friends to mentors to my forum, it's been incredible. But just a quick thing to my mentor, my, my forum, guys, I know you're WPOers, I turn 45 next week or next month. So when you guys recommended this book and I started reading now that you're 60, please, I need a separate reading list, okay? Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>